you ready to start? Yeah, let's go. What is the latest data and research telling us about the current state of climate change? So the current state of climate change is that we are now at more than 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming compared to pre-industrial times before the climate started um, changing through our activities. Wildfires, extreme heat waves, flooding, storms, every community across the world is now being impacted by that. We have broken records in main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, we have doubled the sea level rise. There has been a boost in melting of uh, glaciers and then a boost in melting of uh, both Arctic and uh, Antarctic sea ice. Every increment of a degree of warming increases the risk of crossing tipping points in the climate system. The greatest injustice when it comes to the impacts of climate change is that the people that have contributed the least to the crisis are most vulnerable and have the least adaptive capacity. So when we talk droughts, when we talk extreme heat, when you talk about extreme weather, people's lives, people's livelihoods are really on the line. We're stripping the natural world of its diversity, its wonder, its grace, its beauty, and that makes the world a sadder, poorer place to live. One of the saddest uh, words I've come across in recent years is necro-tourism, which is going to places that are dying, so if we don't go now you won't get to see them. People who are going to the Great Barrier Reef to see it before it's too late, going to climb Kilimanjaro before there are no snows left. We know that human health is impacted by flooding, both directly in terms of loss of life from that flooding, but also indirectly in terms of the increase of vector-borne diseases. By the year 2100, economic damage from uncontrolled climate change is so great that it essentially wipes out economic growth. It essentially matches global GDP. And so that's the extreme case scenario that we are heading in that direction, where the cost of fixing climate change becomes so great that essentially we have no money left for anything else, and we all become a lot poorer. We have to start bending this emission growth curve uh, as, as a matter of urgency, and we have to get rid of uh, coal, oil and natural gas, and we have to stop also the deforestation, especially in Amazonian region and Central African region. In rich countries, the transition is about decarbonizing those economies while still protecting high standards of living for your citizens. But you know, in poor countries where the emissions baseline is so low, where uh, people are living in endemic poverty, where the energy consumption baseline is so low, it's a different approach. This is about um, expanding energy access, it's about creating economic opportunities, it's about building climate resilience to uh, impacts that are already being felt. I get mad at people who say we shouldn't get mad. We should be mad. We should be really angry at the people who have knowingly put us in this position. People who are knowingly hurting other people and making a profit doing so. It's almost like we've given them a pass. So they do have the freedom to dump carbon pollution in the atmosphere, and they've had that freedom for a long time. That central problem that these polluters are dumping carbon pollution in the atmosphere and leaving us with the damages is something that we still haven't quite got our heads around. But where we've still not really had the scale of change that's required is in terms of action. And for example, the prices of solar and wind energy, the batteries, electric vehicles, they have been dropping, and now it's more attractive to invest in solar and wind energy. If we would just eliminate those subsidies and allow renewables to compete on a level playing field, that alone would make a big difference in terms of our capacity to transition our energy economy. And that's something that conservatives should support, because if you believe in a market-based economy, then there's really no good argument for why we're continuing to subsidize the fossil fuel industry. My message to the business and government leaders assembled at Climate Week in New York and beyond is that we really do need a new social contract. Yes, private sector and business will play a huge role in solving this problem, but business as usual cannot deliver the kinds of responses that we need. And so my message to you is really think about it. Think about the ways in which you, your organization, is involved in maintaining the status quo and what it would really take to change that so that we can actually solve this problem.
The point I would like to emphasize is that we're not asking for a change overnight. We've been asking for this for 30 years. So we have essentially stalled, we have dithered, we have delayed for 30 years. But now the time has come to really address the issue. This isn't about tackling the climate crisis as a whole. It's about really coming up with a plan, sector by sector, as to how we do it. We have all the building blocks in order to be able to do it. We just simply haven't put them together to, just, to construct that better world yet. That's the turning point that we're at. Are we globally going to achieve that? Are we each going to play our part in constructing that better future? We need to decide today. There's still hope if we are determined. <laughs>